appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. Okay. My name's Tom. I'm an alcoholic. And by the grace of a loving God, I've been continuously sober since June the 15th of 1986. And I'm very grateful for that date. And I try to uh, try to keep my gratitude going by being of service and, uh, and showing my creator that I am grateful for that, uh, what I've been given. Um, I'll try to do some of this real quick and then get to the... Tom, you just muted yourself. Did you hear me? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, I don't, you know, that's uh, probably a good thing. Anyway, um, I, I don't know if you heard, but I got sober uh, June the 15th of 1986, and I got sober in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico in a treatment center, and I didn't intend to get sober. I went to the treatment center because it was my last uh, chance, uh, basically. We, we had no money, and, um, uh, but my wife had a good job with the state of New Mexico, and so we had insurance. And I had burned my life down horribly. Uh, I, people were looking for me uh, in Santa Fe, and I didn't want them to find me. Um, I, uh, I was just a, an absolute wreck. I, uh, when, when I went into that treatment center, I was uh, physically addicted to, to beverage alcohol, which is not a requirement for alcoholism. It's just I drank so damn much, and I drank every day that if I didn't drink, I'd just start shaking apart. And, um, uh, and I was also physically addicted to heroin at the same time. It's just a horrible, horrible state. And uh, there's a whole back story to that, but I won't go into that because I want to talk more about the 11th step. Anyway, um, I, uh, I owed a lot of money in Santa Fe. I had uh, a lot of bad checks out. Uh, and for younger people, those were this, this book that we would have that you could write an amount of money in it. And uh, people would honor that like currency. Okay, it's a way we used to it's long before Venmo and all that. And uh, I'd been writing them, I figured if I had checks, I had money. And so I just write, you know, keep writing them. And I had a lot of those out and people were looking for me on that. And I owed a lot of money, a lot of different directions. And I, uh, I, had a, uh, I had four children that were terrified of me. I had a wife uh, who is still my wife, Juanita. Um, and I, I just told her earlier, I said, uh, uh, I've got to get on this, this Zoom. I've got to save some souls. She said, why don't you let God do that? So she's always there to remind me. But anyway, um, at the time, she wasn't uh, real happy with me. I, I used to drink in the bathtub and I'd pass out there. And uh, one night she nearly drowned me in the bathtub while I was passed out there. And uh, that ain't a, re a loving relationship, you know, just if you needed a clue on that. Uh, she hated me and my children were terrified of me. I had a, uh, one friend in the world was my business partner. Uh, he was a combat Marine in Vietnam and a damaged guy. And uh, I'd been stealing from our joint bank account and he hadn't found out yet, but when he did, it was not gonna be good. So there was literally no friendly direction for me. I'd been to AA, I'd tried every which way to stop drinking and I'd just given up the, you know, the challenge. I, I decided that some night I would die in a, in a uh, you know, some drunken uh, driving blackout uh, and that everyone who cared about me, you know, would be better off. And I certainly would be better off. So that, that's how I went into this place, just to hide out. Well, it turned out that uh, a little Alcoholics Anonymous meeting was holding their meeting at the treatment center like in the morning uh, and it was a quarter to seven they started this meeting and and they were called dawn patrol which was named after an old errol flynn movie and i know two-thirds of you don't even have a clue who errol flynn was and it doesn't matter but uh he was an australian actor <laughs> you know who came to the united states um and was quite the washbuckler but at any rate, uh, so uh, I, I knew that A would work because I'd already been and then I drank after I went to A. And so I wasn't interested in, in sobriety anyway, but uh, certainly didn't think that this meeting could do anything for me. But what, what was going on was they had, uh, and, and hopefully this illustrates the workings of, of uh, the higher power. Um, I was sitting in the cafeteria one morning uh, in, a, in a hospital, Johnny, with my ass hanging out, 
you know, and sit next to another guy. It was about 6.30 in the morning. And we're looking out these plate glass windows and these people are out there doing things like they have a coffee pot and they're setting things up. And, uh, and I, I say to the guy, what's, you know, what's happening out there? And he said, oh man, it's some extra BS. It's just, it's, it's not part of the program. You don't have to do it. It's some AA thing, you know? And uh, he said, really, o only the ass kissers go out there, you know? And I thought, well, that's not me. You know, I'm a lot of things, but I'm certainly not an ass kisser. Well, many inventories later, I realized I am an ass kisser, but, you know, I wouldn't fess up to it at the time. So um, he said, yeah, I, I said, so I'm not interested in that. And he said, yeah, but they have real coffee with caffeine in it and you can drink as much as you want. And they were serving decaf in the hospital. And I start thinking on day four, I think I'd like a, a, a cheap caffeine buzz. I'd like anything at this point. And I literally went to Alcoholics Anonymous for their coffee. I, I did. So I go out and, uh, and they um, had changed AA am amazingly, you know, since I'd been there in Santa Fe. Uh, one of the things that I disliked about the Santa Fe meetings was they were uh, they were just too, too damn white. I mean, that's what bothered me about it. You know, um, I went in, I had this alter ego thing. I'm married to a Chicana and I run with Chicanos. These are what you might call Mexican Americans, but in Northern New Mexico, it's a special type of person who had always been in Northern New Mexico, like long before there was the United States. And, uh, and so I run with these guys, I speak Spanish. And in the summertime, I get kind of dark. <clears throat> working construction. And so I could pass as what we called a coyote, which is half Hispanic, half, half Anglo, half Hispanic, you know, they call it coyote. And people would say, well, you're coyote, right? And I'd say, yeah, ese, I'm coyote, which was total bullshit. I'm a white boy from Kentucky is what the truth is. But anyway, but I hate me by then. And I, I don't want to be me. So I go in these AA meetings in Santa Fe, and there's nothing but white faces. And I sit there judging every one of them. But I go out to the Dawn Patrol in Albuquerque at the, at the care unit where I was, and God put two Chicano guys in, in the, in the uh, you know, catbird seat, in the, in the uh, secretary and, and uh, whatever you call it, secretary role. And immediately, you know, I perk up my ears because these are, these are my guys, you know. And they start telling these wild stories, and they just completely get my attention. And, and you know, uh, they're laughing and at seven o'clock in the morning, belly laughing. And it's just crazy. I mean, I never experienced it, anything like that. So I keep going out for the coffee. We used to smoke then. You can smoke five, you know, camel cigarettes in the course of an hour. And uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, I go out every day because I don't want to miss the stories. I don't want to miss the next thing. And there's not time to tell you the stories, but they were just you know, funnier than can be and just wild and heartbreaking and everything imaginable. And so, you know, I, I talked to these guys. I mean, I got to know them and, and I went out every day. So they got to know me. And I said to them at one point, I said, um, you know, how, how do guys like you stay sober? Because they were gnarly dudes, you know, they did the things I did. And, uh, <clears throat> and they both said the same thing independently of each other. They said, in the morning, we pray to God and we ask God to keep us sober. And at night, if we're sober, we thank God for our sobriety and we never miss. We never miss that piece. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, are you, you're trying to sell me fairy tales. You know, you're, 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 you want me to, you know, the God that doesn't exist, you know, the fairy tale God, you want me to get on board with that. And uh, at, at one, one morning I was out there and I was probably saying something like that. And James, one of these guys looked at me and he said, you need to find a higher power that you can do business with. And he just left that hanging. And uh, what he was telling me was the same thing that Ebby Thatcher told Bill Wilson. Bill, why don't you choose your own conception of, of God, you know? And um, at any rate, uh, you know, I, I pondered that. I thought that was pretty hip sounding, but I didn't understand it. And, uh, and then about four, and I felt sorry for these guys for this praying to the fairy tale God, you know. And, and about some days later, uh, four or five days later, James told a story and he said, you know, last weekend I took my girls to the state fair. I took my two daughters, my, my ex-wife let me take my two daughters to the state fair and my heart broke. 
because I didn't have the wherewithal to take my kids to the state fair. I, I, I didn't never had the money to drive 60 miles with them to take them to the state fair. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm looking down on these guys because they pray to the God that doesn't exist, but their lives have meaning and purpose and mine's completely burned down and in the toilet. And so I thought, how could it hurt me to pray to the God that doesn't exist, right? to the fairy tale God. And I started doing that. I did the, the nighttime. Thank you for my sobriety. It was kind of like snarky at first, you know, thank you for my sobriety. And, and I did that for about four nights and I, I felt a comfort come over me, just a, a, a feeling of comfort. And I just kept it up the whole time I was in there. Now, when I got out of there, I'd been clean and sober both for 33 days. And my personal best in 16 years was eight days in a row on what we used to call the Natch. That means no drugs, no alcohol, okay? And so when, when I looked at it, I went, now what's, you know, 33 days, that's a, you know, Tom's personal record, what's different? And the only thing I could see that was different besides going to this AA meeting every morning was the fact that I prayed and thanked God for my sobriety at night. And I just kept that up, okay? I kept it up. You know, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into this because this is good stuff, but so um, I, I was invested in prayer because I was convinced that that was what was keeping me sober, okay? And there's a long story about that. And, and you know, for, for five years, I did that every night. And I thought that, you know, I had to give God something. I had to bribe God in order to keep me sober. And, and I had to express my gratitude that way. And then something happened in our family. You know, my youngest daughter uh, attempted suicide and it just knocked me off my beam completely. And, and I stopped saying the prayer um, for about three nights. I didn't say that, thank you for my sobriety. And then on the fourth night, I went, oh my God, I've stopped saying the thank you for my sobriety prayer. And my very next thought was, you think you have to bribe God or thank God in order to stay sober, you know? Um, because it, I, I made God human. I gave God human qualities. And if, if I was God and I was keeping you sober and you didn't thank me, you ungrateful SOB, I'd get your ass drunk, you know? But I found out that God doesn't work that way, that I've got nothing to offer God, that the sobriety is a free gift it's a, it, it, and it doesn't cost me a thing except opening up my heart and my mind and accepting it and doing certain things. The book talks about this. When I got sober and came back to Santa Fe, Santa Fe was a 12 and 12 town. And so I went to a lot of 12 and 12 meetings and, and it's, it's a really kind of an intellectual, you know, exercise. And when I, I hit a wall at five years sober and was led to some big book people and, and uh, really a conference in Colorado called Fellowship of the Spirit. And, and that changed my entire life. I mean, that changed everything, you know. And, um, and what, I, what they told me was the big book has a set of instructions or directions in there. The 12 and 12 has some really great zingers and some, some you know, uh, real good essays on the steps, but it's ha really hard to find instruction in the 12 and 12, but it's laid out in the big book. And if you'll do what it says to do, you'll recover from alcoholism. And I was just like, I need something, man. And, and so that's, that's when I got after it. That's when I became a big book guy. <clears throat> so one of the things um, that I tried to do early on was meditate. Like within the first six months, I tried to meditate. And man, it was not a good place to go. There was no quiet or peace in my head whatsoever. You know, it was, it was the chatter of 10,000 monkeys, not just a thousand. And, uh, and I just, I didn't like it, you know, and uh, I was trying to quit smoking at the time and a lot was going on. And I, I, I didn't want to miss this piece because it's integral to the 11th step and, and to what we're going to be talking about. Um, when I finally bit the bullet or took the bit in my teeth or whatever you want to say, and I, I actually made my amends and finished my amends, which took a long time. I was 38 when I got sober. I owed scads of money. I'd hurt tons of people. They were scattered all over the United States. And, and I had to do some real hard work to, to achieve that. But once I did, the, the, the monkeys came down to about three from 10,000. And then it was a safe place to go in meditation. And there's a lot I could, I could talk for two hours about meditation. But anyway, but I won't. You know, I don't know if Ali, uh, did you go to the Thursday night uh, the emotional sobriety workshop. 
this this lad we we have a thing a sponsee of mine in tennessee he does this emotional sobriety workshop and aas and al anons speak on it and um it's it's not like any regular meeting because it's not a meeting it's a workshop and uh last week kathy h the al anon from from uh, cincinnati spoke and she kept saying you know the god of my experience the god of my experience the God of my experience instead of the God of my understanding. And that is so important. If, if I have time, I wanna end this with a, with a story about something that happened when I went to Russia for AA. Anyway, um, but getting back to the topic, <laughs> which I haven't been to yet, um, we, we take this pretty literally, the people in my, in my lineage, you know, uh, the uh, 86 through 88. And so I was reading the nightly review uh, stuff for, for a bunch of years. And a sponsee of mine in Texas wrote, wrote out the questions and sent me, uh, he faxed it to me. And so for a few years, I had this like sheath of papers that were the, the, the questions, right? Well, eventually um, I was inspired when my, when my sponsor died, um, who his name was Don and I'll, I'll reference him a bit. When he died, a lot of things happened to me. I was grieving a lot and, and a lot happened. And I was inspired to make a book, okay, which I will show you. This is the book. I don't know if you can read the, the questions. But the reason, and I, and I made this and I, for, I gave it to my um, sponsees for Christmas that year. And I, I wrote a whole thing about Don and how much he'd meant to me, but at any rate, so the, the reason for the book is that it's, you can keep it on your nightstand and you can write this stuff out. And when you write it out, it's real different than thinking about it and falling asleep in the middle. So I mean, that, was the, that was the point of it. And so it said, when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Was I resentful? Uh, was I selfish? Was I dishonest? Was I afraid? Do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to myself which should be discussed with another person at once? Was I kind and loving toward all? Man, that's a tall order, I'll tell you. Did I gossip about anyone? Now, this is not, we, we this stuff is not copywritten. We lost our copyright to the 164 pages of the big book uh, quite a while ago. Um, so it's, it's public domain. But so I could mess with this a little bit. And I added one question because it was a problem for me. Did I gossip about anyone today? Okay, there's a lot in the 12 and 12 about gossip. Um, but I, it was enough of a problem with me that I added it to the, to the 14 questions or 13 before I added it. Um, what could I have done better? Was I thinking of myself most of the time? Was I thinking of what I could do for others? Was I thinking of what I could pack into the stream of life? Okay, how can I make life better? And then it says, number 13, be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. Um, I think it goes on to say for that would diminish our, our effectiveness to others or something like that. Um, and so I, I asked myself, did I drift into worry today, remorse today, or morbid reflection? You know, I, I gave a guy this, he says, Man, I've always been a morbid reflector, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole thing on that too. And number 14, after making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. And in the beginning, you know, because I was developing this conception, my own, you know, the God I could do business with, my, my God didn't judge me, so there was no need to ask for forgiveness. That's how I ra rationalized that. But later I realized God doesn't need to forgive me, but I do need to ask for forgiveness. It's an important piece. And, and I never forget that. I never, I never leave that one out, okay? So I say, God, please forgive me for, for missing the mark today, you know, and show me what corrective measures I should take. And uh, Don, my, my sponsor, used to talk about his grandfather. And he said that when, when you asked his grandfather something at night, he like a, a, a tough question, He'd say, I don't know, uh, let me sleep on that and I'll get back to you in the morning uh, because things change, you know, overnight. So what I, what the other thing I did with this little book 
I don't know if you can see this or not. I don't know if it's important that you can. It says, turn the page over and write your plan for tomorrow. Now, on awakening, we, we were supposed to consider our plans for the day. That's what the book says, right? So Don used to say, if I'm going to consider my plans for the day, it would be nice to have some plans to consider, right? So it's a blank page on the back. And then I write out my plan for tomorrow, okay? Then in the morning, I can consider that plan and maybe I want to change it, you know? And uh, this seems a little mechanical and probably because it is mechanical, you know? But I can't tell you how many people that, that I've either given that book to or they printed their own book or whatever that combined that with meditation and said it was just life changing. That, you know, it was so incredible how it worked. I mean, I, I could talk for probably two hours on those three pages about the power of the pause and all that stuff. But, you know, uh, you guys wanted, a, wanted a, um, a specific topic. And so that was the best one I could give you. Do I have some time left, Ali? Is there, because I want to tell a story. You got 20 minutes left? I do? My yeah, God. 15 to 20. Yeah, you shouldn't have said that. Um, okay, well, so th that's what we try to do. Now, am I perfect at this? No. Uh, do I do it every night? I wished I did. Um, do I tell my sponsees they ought to? Yes, I do, you know, because it's true. But I haven't done it probably in five nights. I mean, just to just to bring you current and, and tell you. But I know when I do it, it 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 pays dividends. Okay. So the story I wanted to tell you, and it this is I, how this is connected. I'm not quite sure, but it came to me, and I follow these these you know prompts that I get. And I say from spirit. Um, in 014, a guy asked me to go to uh, Russia with him for Alcoholics Anonymous. They had, a, they had a thing called Fellowship of the Spirit in Moscow, and, 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 and uh, he, we were going to do the traditions in Moscow and then tell our story a lot and do some step workshops. And, um, and so anyway, I, I said I would do it. Uh, there's kind of a backstory to that, but um, they wanted us to go to Moscow in January, and I wasn't too keen about that. And then they, the Russians called back. They said, how about May? You know, and they said, yes, May would be a lot better. So anyway, we went, we, we were 12 days in Russia, a man named J.R. Harmon from, I shouldn't have broken his anonymity, but you ought to get him on here, he's good. Um, he lives in Northern California uh, in a place called Pollock Pines. And um, so uh, we went to, went to Moscow and we did the traditions in Moscow, that was the Fellowship of the Spirit part, told our story a few times, and then they flew us to Siberia. And in Siberia, we, we landed, it was 4,800 miles that we, that we traversed. We landed in this town, we told our story, we spent the night. The next day they drove us eight, eight hours along one of the longest lakes in the world, Lake Baikal. And uh, we got to another town and the, we told our story again. And then immediately they threw us on a sleeper train. We went 12 hours to this town called Chita. And Chita is 100 miles from Mongolia, 300 from China. And uh, anyway, so the first night we get there, I mean, we were wasted. You know, we've been traveling. We haven't been sleeping well. And uh, the first night we get there, they say, well, there's these Russian officials who want to interview you because they want to know more about AA. They want to specifically know how it's going to work in their correction system. OK, so Don Pritz, my sponsor, took what we think is the first legal AA to Russia in 1988. And I'd heard him talk on this. So I was kind of had some background on this of things to say and not to say. So they, they load us up and they take us to, I think it was a school. And there were these six Russian officials. They were all women. And they were like, one was the warden of a, a jail. One was a warden of a, of a prison. One was a social worker. But they all came out of the old school communist bureaucracy. They were all basically bureaucrats and uh, not communist any longer, but they came out of that system. And so their first question to us was, um, how, how will AA work in our correction system? Well, I knew from being Don Sponsee that there's no good answer to that, right? And so the answer is this, I don't know. I've only been in Russia like eight days. And I couldn't tell you exactly if it will work in your system or not, but I know it's worked very well in the United States and a lot of other places. And I've done a lot of prison work and I, I know that it works. 
And so they kind of, you know, digested that. And then the, the, the next question was the real zinger. This woman said, uh, well, what about this God thing? You know, AA sounds like a religion. Is it a religion? And so she let that hang. And I, I, you know, I got quiet for a minute and I went inside and the stuff that I answered, I had never thought of before and I'd never planned to, to say, okay. Stuff, when this happens, it, you get high on it. That's all I can tell you. So I waited a minute and I said, um, okay, no. I said, we're, we're not a religion. We're, we're definitely not a religion. I said, when, I know this God word bothers you. I said, but when we say God, I said, we have a book that says deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. And it may have been messed up by things that happened and this and that, but somewhere deep inside you, okay? They, they read it in the spiritual appendix, you know, an unsuspected inner resource. What a deal. Who, who suspected that? I mean, in my world. And, and so I said, you know, that the book says that deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. And I said, when we say God, we mean things like a, an incredibly beautiful sunset that you might see, that just, you can't take your eyes off it. It's just hard, but you might tear up just watching it. It's so incredibly beautiful. And then, you know, the, the, you see a, a, an incredibly beautiful flower and the feeling that that brings up in you you know, of, of how beautiful nature can be, you know? And then I said, you know, the, the love that you have for your children, that's like no other love on, on earth, you know? Those things, that's what we're talking about when we say God. And I said, and all of this is coming out of me. I mean, I'm not, this is not rehearsed, it's not thought out. And I said, if you guys will look out that window and they all turn and they look out the window, I said, there's that tree right outside the window. I said, we, we don't, we can't see the wind, okay? But we see those leaves moving on that tree. And so that's the manifestation of the wind. And we can't argue that the wind doesn't exist, even though we can't see it through the out, outside this building. I said, we in Alcoholics Anonymous know of hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were completely ruined. And today they have productive and, and, and relatively happy lives. And you know they're back in society and making a difference. And so we know that that, and they say that they depend on this power, okay? This power of spirit or whatever you want to call it, power of God. And so we know that that power exists, whatever it is. We can't, we can't really define it, but we know it exists because we've seen the manifestation of it, you know? And they're kind of nodding their heads. And so I, I put a, a kind of a, a, you know, a clincher on it, you know? And I said, you know, years ago, um, I saw a film about the, the psychiatric godfather of Alcoholics Anonymous, whose name was Carl Jung. And they start kind of, you know, tittering like they, they you know, they know you. I'm getting a little street cred just mentioning Jung, right? And because they know who he is. And I said, you know, in, in this, uh, this, this film, Jung is being interviewed by the BBC. And the BBC interviewers, and this is towards the end of Dr. Jung's life. And he says, Dr. Jung, he says, based on some things you've written and things that you've said, it would lead a person to, to think that you believe in God. Is that true? And Jung's smoking a pipe, which he did. And he takes a hit off his pipe and he, and he thinks a minute. And he says, belief in God. He goes, no, that would require a leap of faith. I do not believe in God. I know God there's a difference. And I think I got him with that. I think, I think that, you know, at least they, they had a, a more clear understanding, you know, of what we're trying to do and what we're about. And uh, all of that came from spirit, man. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have thought that up, you know, by myself in a, in a thousand years, you know, it just came from some deep spot. So um, I don't know if any of that made sense. Um, there was a lot more I wanted to say about the 11th step. Um, but basically, you know, uh, here, I'll end with this. Um, we, <laughs> I'll tell you, the ego uh, is a many splendored thing, and it will always work at me trying to screw me up somehow or another, man. And, and one of the ways it does is it has me judging my fellow humans, which is absolutely absurd, you know, but so uh, for years, you'd hear somebody in a meeting say, well, when I do my 10th step at night, 
And then immediately, you know, my mind slammed shut. I think they're a 12 and 12 person. They're not a big book person because they wouldn't say that if they were. And it dawned on me at some, you know, it's just, just absurd. And it dawned on me at some point, it doesn't matter if they call it a 10 step or an 11 step. What matters is if they do it or not, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm becoming more open-minded uh, the older I get. I better hurry up because I may not have that many years left. And, uh, and I, I just got to tell you, I am beholden to Alcoholics Anonymous. What it has given me is beyond verbiage. I couldn't put it into words, you know, what I've been given. And my family has been given, you know. And so uh, I'm here for the duration, you know. Um, if you guys will do this, I promise you I will too. And thanks for asking me. I really appreciate being here. God bless you.